the previous video, we created a simple web service, but now we're going to create a slightly more complex one that utilizes Node's HTTP client object. So in this project, we're going to create a rudimentary HTTP proxy server using Node.js. The goal is to be able to type in a URL like this, addressing our server and passing a URL parameter of the page or the resource that we want to get. And Node will just proxy the request and get the data and pass it back to us, and we'll see how that goes. So the flow of data looks something like this. The browser makes our request with the URL that it wants to get. Our node server gets the request and then creates its own client to go out to the remote server that we're requesting and make that request. Then the remote server will send back some headers and our server will send our headers back to the browser. And then after that, any number of times data will be sent over and we'll just send the data from the server back to the browser. So we're not doing nothing more than just passing data back to the browser a whole bunch of times. And then finally, the remote proxy connection will end, and then we'll end our connection. Now the benefit here is that the code is only running for short bursts. So the code for this particular request is only running to get the request and send out the immediate request. And then when the headers come in, then the code fires up again, and the headers get sent. So you can imagine if there are multiple requests to our node server going on, Throughout time, they could be sort of meshed together where the request would come in for one request and then the next request come in. And so we don't have to wait for this whole process to complete for one request before we can handle the next one. So we use Node's event-driven software to handle a higher number of concurrent proxy requests at the same time. Because we have a couple of different requests going on, we have the request from the browser to the server, and then from the server to the remote server uh, acting as the proxy, it's going to get a little confusing because we have sort of the two requests going on. So inside of our code, we're going to be prefixing everything that happens between the browser and our node.js server with a B underscore to say browser. So we'll have a browser request, a browser response, and a browser URL. And then everything that has to deal with the remote server or the proxy will be prefixed with a P. So since there are requests and response for both the browser and the proxy, hopefully this namespace will help us clear up the code just a little bit. So let's jump over to the code and start off. So let's clear this out. First thing we want to do is require the libraries that we'll need. So I'm going to just drop these in here. We saw the sys and the HTTP libraries in our previous video. A new one that we're bringing in is the URL library, which allows us to parse URLs into meaningful parts that we can dissect and use later. So we're going to be using that. So we're going to start off with our standard HTTP.createServer call. And so we're going to pass it a function, and we'll call it a, the browser request, and the browser response will be passed to it. And the first thing we want to do inside the function is parse the URL of our request. So we're going to get the browser URL and we're going to parse our request object's URL object. Now the url.parse method is part of the URL library. And what this does is it takes a string, the normal URL string, and breaks it onto an object with properties like hostname, path, query, etc. Now when you normally do url.parse, the query parameter, which is this fragment here, like foo equals bar, or in our case, URL equals HTTP dot dot dot. The query parameter of the URL object will just be a string. But if we pass true to the second argument, it'll actually break it out into an object. So we'll have foo bar or URL is HTTP whatever. And so in our case, since we want to actually get a specific parameter out of it, we're going to pass true so we can get easy access to our URL. Now we need to do a little bit of error handling here. So what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to check that there actually is a query in the request URL. And if there's not a query, and that query string doesn't contain a URL parameter, we're going to go ahead and stop this request with not found. And that's just a function we're going to write real quick, which allows us to sort of isolate the code for sending a 404 response. So let's just put this here. So our special not found function will take a response object, it'll write out a 404 header, and give it a little bit of text uh, describing the error. And since we return, we won't execute the code below it, so hopefully we won't get any errors. 
we have our browser URL object, of which we'll be able to get uh, the URL parameter that the user passes to it. So we're going to do that right now, and we're going to actually get this URL. So inside of our BURL object, we, like I said, we have our query object. And inside of there, there should be a URL parameter, which will actually be the URL of the resource that we want to get. Now again, we're doing the URL.parse because in order to create our HTTP client that's actually going to go out and get that information, we need the host name, the port, and the path all separated out. So we're going to use the URL.parse again so we can get all that information very easily. You notice I didn't pass true because I don't really care about what the actual parameters are on the proxy URL. We only really care about the major parts like the host name and the path. So now that we have our URL that we want to target, we're going to create an HTTP client. And this object will be what goes out and actually retrieves the information from the remote host. So let's bring this up on the page just a little bit. So we're going to create our proxy client. And we're going to do that by calling HTTP.createClient. Now this takes two arguments, a port number and a host name of the server that we want to contact. In our case, our proxy URL object may or may not have a port property. If the URL contained a colon 3000, for instance, then it would have a port. If it didn't, then it wouldn't have a port property, so we would have to have a default to 80, which is the sensible default. Then we're going to pass it the hostname attribute of the proxy URL. And so this would be, in our case, something like twitter.com or any other hostname. And so now we actually want to create a request for our proxy client. So we'll call the request method on our proxy client. And it takes three arguments. The first is the HTTP method that we want to use. In our case, we'll use a simple get request. The second is the path that we want to request. In our case, the path name object of our proxy URL should have that. If there isn't a path name, then we will default to just the root slash. And finally, we need to pass it some headers. The most important one is the host header, and we can get that at the host name. And we need to send this because it's a required header, because a lot of servers will have multiple host names on the same IP address. So this is what tells the server software which host name is actually requesting. After we create a request, we're going to call request.end on it, and that will actually send out the request. Now obviously we don't want to wait for all the data to come back, so we're going to use event-driven programming and create some listeners for the response of that request to come back. So on the request, we're going to call add listener, and we're going to listen for the response event. And when that fires, it's going to pass the proxy's response object into our function. So this response callback will be called when we get the actual headers for our information. So the first thing we want to do is pass the headers along to the browser. So to our browser's response object, we're going to call write head and we'll pass the proxy responses status code and the proxy responses headers to the browser. So it's a simple pass through. Then there's going to be multiple pieces of data from coming from the proxy to us. So we want to listen for the data event on the proxy result. So every time we get a piece of data from the proxy, it's going to call this and pass it the chunk of data that it got. So we're going to just pass to the browser and call dot write and just pass the chunk. So it's pretty simple. We just pass it through. Every time we get data, we send it to the browser. Finally, we want to listen for the end event, and that'll happen on the HTTP client. So on our proxy response, we'll listen for the end. And when it ends, we'll end our browser response, and that will finish our request. So finally, on our, on our HTTP server, we have to call the dot .listen method, and we'll pass it a port number and a host name. And let's just put a message here. So let's take a look and see if that works. We'll go ahead and start up our server our node proxy.js, we have it running. And so our URL here is 127.0.0.1 on port 3000, and we're passing URL is Twitter's URL. So let's see what happens. It's taking a little while while it gets data, and now we have all that information. Now, it won't work for everything, because a lot of websites, like for instance Google, will try to bust this type of thing. So as soon as we go there, they redirect around to actual Google. So it won't work for everything, but it gives you an idea of how the event-driven architecture of Node allows us to write code that can allow multiple connections to be able to do long-running processes all at the same time.
and now I've seen how to use Node's event-driven libraries to create a simple and scalable proxy. In future videos, we'll take a look at some other capabilities that Node offers. Mm -hmm.